Hello and welcome to Ridge Church Online. My name is Krista and I'm your online host today and we are so glad that you found your way into this service. And if you're new joining us in this online service, I just wanna say a special welcome to you. I would love it if you pick up your phone and just email us at hello at ridgechurch.ca and Dana, our Director of Connection and Community, she would love to just reach back out to you to get to know you a bit more and to let you know a bit more about what's going on here in the life of our church. And uh, today, you know, one of the main things that we value most at Ridge Church is a relationship with Jesus. Uh, we care deeply that our city would know Jesus, and our city includes people that are, have been believing for a long time and those that are brand new to the faith. And so if you would, you can go onto our website, which is uh, www.ridgechurch.ca at slash know Jesus, and you can find out a bit more about who he is. You can hear Pastor Jonathan's heart for those around Around us that they would know who he is and uh, I just really encourage you towards that. In the new year we're going to be starting a new program called Starting Point and obviously another thing that we've got in our uh, three things that we care about is Jesus, community and city and so community groups are really important and we're sort of we're figuring out how to do those online continually we we used to in, in the pandemic we had all of our groups meeting online and so if that's of interest to you again please reach out to us uh, either dana or hello at ridgechurch.ca and we would love to sort of help you get connected to the community life here at our church Again, we're walking through the book of Exodus right now. Uh, we're in our Sovereign series, so we hope that you're tracking alongside in that. And again, our community questions are in there. So if you are interested in what goes on in our community groups, you can kind of check that out under the sermon tab on our online uh, platform there. Again, uh, we are so thrilled that you're here, and we're just going to take a moment to settle our hearts as we lead into service. So take about 10 seconds, and then we'll pray. All right, let's pray. Father, again, we are just so thankful that we have this way to connect with you um, in a Sunday service. And God, whether we're watching that at, at various times in our week, we're just, we're grateful that we can gather together in this way. And God, we just ask that wherever we find ourselves, whatever life situation we're in right now, that you would just meet us in that that we would know more deeply who your son is, that we would put our trust in Jesus even more today than we ever have before. And God, that you would do a work in our life to transform us, to renew us, to restore us. And God, we just pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, let's worship together. Father's love for us, how vast beyond all measure, that he should give his only son to make a wretch his treasure. How great the pain. Sons to glory. Behold the man upon the cross, my sin upon his shore.
gifts, no power, no wisdom. But I will boast in Jesus Christ. Welcome today. If you're new, I want to say to you a special welcome. My name is Jonathan. I'm the lead pastor here at Ridge Church, and we are in a series through the book of Exodus. And in fact, today we are going to cover Exodus chapters 7, 8, 9, and 10, which is, which is a lot. Typically we do, you know, 10 or 12 verses on a, on a, when we talk through one of these passages, we're going to do like four chapters. So that means that today we're going to cruise. Otherwise we'll be here all day. And uh, we, are, uh, we are looking at nine of the ten plagues that God sent on the land of Egypt. And so it's necessary for us to look at those together because, of course, uh, there's a message there. There's, there's a lesson there that God has for us in all of that as we look at it together. So we're going to look at it uh, this week. Uh, and then beginning next week, if you can believe it, it's already Advent. It's already the beginning of Christmas. And so for the next four weeks, we're going to pause in our series in Exodus and we're going to look at the names, the titles of Jesus. Because when he's born, not only is he given a name, but he's given these titles. And, you know, in, in, uh, when, when we have a baby, we think a lot about the name. And, you know, we're not royalty. We don't think about titles. But, but titles communicate a lot about a person, about who they are, about, about what they're about. And so we're going to look at those titles and examine the hope and the joy and the life that is found in Jesus. And so, uh, you know, it's always, it's always great to invite people to join you. Uh, for church, to explore faith, but certainly Christmas is a, is a particularly good time. So I just want to encourage you uh, to join people, invite people to join us either online or in person uh, over this next Advent season. But today, today we're going to start by looking at the, 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 the first of the nine plagues, for, of the ten plagues actually, that God visits upon Egypt. And that begins in Exodus chapter 7. Here's, here's how uh, the passage begins. It says this, And the Lord said to Moses, See, I have made you like God to Pharaoh, and your brother Aaron shall be your prophet. You shall speak all that I command, and your brother Aaron shall tell Pharaoh to let the people of Israel go out of his land. But I will harden Pharaoh's heart, and though I multiply my signs and wonders in the land of Egypt, Pharaoh will not listen to you. Then I will lay my hand on Egypt and bring my hosts, my people, the children of Israel, out of the land of Egypt by great acts of judgment. The Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord when I stretch out my hand against Egypt and bring out the people of Israel from among them. So God explains now to Moses, here's what I am going to do. He says, first of all, I am going to harden Pharaoh's heart so that even as I, you know, call him to let the people of Israel go, he's going to refuse. And secondly, he says, that's going to allow me to multiply my signs of wonder. Really, to, to, he means to send a bunch of plagues on the people of Egypt. And thirdly, he says, so that in the end, in the end, my people will go and they, they will be allowed to go. And the question that we want to wrestle with is, why is God doing it this way? I mean, why, why is God going to harden Pharaoh's heart and then send all these plagues on the land of Egypt? And, and God's going to give us a number of reasons why he's doing it. But here's the first. It's found in verse 5. He says this. The Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord when I stretch out my hand against Egypt and bring out the people of Israel from among them. In other words, God is going to harden Pharaoh's heart and send plagues on the people of Egypt so that they will know in the end that indeed 
God, Yahweh, is the true God. You see, the Egyptians, like virtually everyone in the ancient world, they were polytheists. In other words, they believed in multiple gods. They were pantheists. They believed that, that God was part of nature. Nature itself was a god. And they were syncretists, which meant that they, they thought that the idea of exclusive worship of one god was foolishness. Instead, they picked and chose and kind of mashed together a set of beliefs that they believed would help them succeed in life. And you have to understand that in the ancient world, worship of God wasn't a theoretical thing, just like it isn't today. Nobody worships a God then or now that they don't think will make a difference in their life. And so they, they worship these gods that, that they believe made them to be the greatest, the most powerful, the, the most brilliant culture in the entire world. I mean, they saw their way of life, their culture, their worldview as being superior to any other nation, to any other people. Theirs was the right way to live. And they believed that that, that was because of the gods that they worshipped. They made them superior. It was their gods who made them, them rich and beautiful and powerful and made their land fertile and, and wealthy. And so those were the gods in whom they trusted. And why on earth would they put any trust? Why on earth would they believe the invisible God of the, of the Israelite slaves. I mean, that, that made no sense to them. And now God, Yahweh, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the, the great I am, the, this God is going to harden Pharaoh's heart so that he can demonstrate to the people of Egypt that indeed he is the only true God. In fact, later in Exodus chapter 12, he, he says this is what he was doing. He's, he says, I will bring judgment on all the gods of Egypt because he says, I am Yahweh. I am the real God. So that's the first reason why God is going to harden Pharaoh's heart, because he wants the people of Egypt to understand that he alone is God. But here's the second reason. He also hardens Pharaoh's heart so that Israel will know who God is, that he is God. Because you have to understand the people of Israel, I mean, they have lived for over 400 years now in the land of Egypt. And they have experienced the might and the majesty and the power of the Egyptian culture. And it would be impossible that they lived for 400 years in the land of Egypt and didn't take on some of the belief systems of Egypt. I mean, more than anyone, they would have seen the power and the might of what seemed to be the Egyptian gods. And, 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 and they would have been drawn to that. And now God is going to perform these incredible, miraculous signs and wonders so that the people of Israel, the people that God has chosen, would also know that it isn't the gods of Egypt, that it isn't Pharaoh, but that it is Yahweh alone who is control over their life and who is worthy of serving. And so God is going to, Yahweh is going to utterly humiliate the gods of Egypt so that they understand that they are just worthless idols. And and, and you got to remember that, that God is doing this by hardening Pharaoh's heart. God is going to prevent Pharaoh. God is going to willingly prevent Pharaoh from responding to the, to the plagues that he sends on him in a, in, a, in a positive way. In other words, he's going to make sure that, that Pharaoh rejects any opportunity to let the people of Israel go. And this is what basically is going to happen in these first nine plagues. God is going to toy with Pharaoh. God is going to do whatever he pleases with Pharaoh. In fact, God is so powerful that in his might and in his utter sovereignty, he is not only going to free his people from Israel, but he will also dictate to Pharaoh his response. So don't miss this. I mean, this is the whole point. The deliverance of the people of Israel from from Egypt is entirely God's doing under his complete and utter control. And no one and nothing else has any real say in it. As one author put it, the Exodus is like a play in which God is the author, producer, director, and the primary actor. And Israel's fate, and in fact Egypt's fate, is utterly in God's hand. And just to make sure that we know that it is utterly God, this is what Moses tells us next in this passage. In verse 6, he's writing about him and Aaron. He says this, Moses and Aaron did so. They did just as the Lord commanded them. Now Moses was 80 years old and Aaron 83 years old when they spoke to Pharaoh. Moses says... Just so you know, we were old guys by the time we did this. Like, like we weren't in our 40s full of energy and, and, and all kinds of energy. We were like tired. We were old. And, and, and we didn't have any experience leading an exodus. We didn't have any credibility, not in the eyes of Pharaoh, hardly in the eyes of the people of Israel. We had no strategic plan. We had nothing to do with this except the one thing. We were just obedient to do now whatever God told us to do. 
Everything here forward is all God's doing. And so here's what the Lord tells him to do. Verse 8. Then the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, When Pharaoh says to you, prove yourselves by working a miracle, then you shall say to Aaron, take your staff and cast it down before Pharaoh, that it may become a serpent. So Moses and Aaron went to Pharaoh and did just as the Lord commanded. Aaron cast down his staff before Pharaoh and his servants, and it became a serpent. Then Pharaoh summoned the wise men and the sorcerers, and they, the magicians of Egypt, also did the same by their secret arts. For each man cast down his staff, and they became serpents. But Aaron's staff swallowed up their staffs. You know, if you've ever seen a picture of King Tut, you know, his sarcophagus is all gold and he's got this huge headdress on. You remember at the very top is a picture of a serpent or a, a statue of a serpent, right? Because a serpent in Egypt represented the power of the Egyptian empire. And now God says to Aaron, you throw down your staff and it will become a serpent. It was a direct challenge by becoming a serpent, it was a direct challenge to the power of Pharaoh in Egypt. And so Pharaoh calls in his, his wise men, his sorcerers, his magicians, and he says, you do the same. And they do. Bang. They throw down their staffs. And now there's all sorts of snakes slithering across the floor. But, but Aaron's snake swallows up all of those snakes. And that should have been the moment where, where, you know, lights went off in Pharaoh's mind. I mean, that's the moment, you know, where like the doorbell, like ding dong. Pharaoh, there's someone at the door and, and you better pay attention because you have no idea who's about to come through that door. I mean, this was, this was a warning sign for Pharaoh. And here's how Pharaoh responds. Moses writes, still, Pharaoh's heart was hardened, and he would not listen to them as the Lord had said. Just as the Lord had said. I mean, now God is going to toy with Pharaoh. Now God is going to display his utter sovereignty, his, his incredible majesty over the, uh, all of Egypt. And now he's going to pour out his signs and wonders. He's going to pour out his plagues on Pharaoh and the people of Egypt. And so the first, the first plague that he pours out on them is that he turns the Nile River into blood. And in the end, the, the fish die and the people of Egypt can't drink the water. And you have to understand how significant the Nile is in Egypt. I mean, it, it was the source of life, the primary source of all of life in Egypt. Everyone in Egypt lived along the Nile River. And it was the source of their economic prosperity and, and water for their daily life. And not only that, it was worshipped as one of their gods. In fact, the Egyptian god of the Nile had a name. The name was Happy, and, and Happy was a, a god who was a hermaphrodite. In other words, it was a god that was both male and female. Because in the Egyptian mindset, the, 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 the Nile, the, the god of the Nile, both fertilized the land, that was the male side, and nourished the land. And that happened every time that the, 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 the river flooded. And as it flooded, it would fertilize land. And as it receded, the, the water would cause the, the crops to grow. It was the source of life for the people of, of Egypt. It was a source of wealth for them. And now the, God turns the source of life for G Egypt into a source of death. He utterly humiliates the God of the Nile by turning it into blood. It's fascinating to note that it was the Nile that Pharaoh had ordered all of the Egyptian boys, the baby boys, to be thrown into. It was a place of death for the Egyptian baby boys. And now God, the God of the Israelites, now he turns that same river into a place of death for the Egyptians. But Pharaoh's magicians, they also do the same thing. They find a little bit of water and, and, and they turn it into blood as well. Now, they can't undo what God did. They, they can't reverse it. They can just feebly imitate it. But for Pharaoh, that's enough. Here's what happens. Pharaoh's heart remained hardened, and he would not listen to them, as the Lord had said. So now God says the second plague, frogs. Frogs come up from the Nile by the millions. I mean, they, they, he says they swarm across the land. They're everywhere. They're in people's beds and in their bedrooms and in their kitchens and their ovens where they sit, where they walk, they're stepping on them. I mean, they are everywhere. And, and, and it's, it's terrible. And so Pharaoh comes to, to Moses and he says, please, please, uh, you know, make this stop. And, and Moses says, okay, you name the time so that you know that God is in control. And Pharaoh says, tomorrow. And so Moses goes and prays, and the next day, all the frogs end up dying. 
And now the Egyptians, they pile up these massive piles of dead frogs. And in the hot sun, they rot and the stench of it fills the land. And you have to understand that in the Egyptian world, the frog was the symbol of the god Hecate, who was the goddess of childbirth. And and you remember that the Egyptians tried to control the, the childbirth of the Israelites. I mean, again, they tried to limit their population by having the, their infant baby boys thrown into the Nile River. And now God takes the symbol of their fertility and he piles it up as death rotting all over the land of Egypt. And it's an ominous sign to the Egyptians of what is about to come in their world. But Pharaoh's magicians can also not stop this, but they managed to do a feeble imitation. They managed to get a few frogs to, to appear. And again, for Pharaoh, that's enough. And so here's the response again. But when Pharaoh saw that there was a respite, he hardened his heart and he would not listen to them as the Lord had said. God toys with Pharaoh. God is utterly in control of everything that happens and now he sends the next plague. The next plague, gnats. Now gnats, now gnats is an English term. It's the best translation from the Hebrew term, but it literally refers to two-winged insects that bite. Like, for instance, mosquitoes. You know, uh, this summer, Nula and I, we, uh, we, it was a beautiful summer day. We thought, let's go down to Kanaka Creek. Let's go for a walk by the river. But as I was driving there, I was like, I'm kind of worried because, you know, there's not a lot of parking. It's a gorgeous night. And we pulled up at Kanaka Creek. We could park anywhere we want. I'm like, wow, this is awesome. We got the place to ourselves. And Nula and I, we get out of the car. We start walking. It's such a beautiful evening. And about 20 steps in, we realize we are swarmed with mosquitoes. I mean, we're slapping as fast as we can. And we're slapping each other. And, and we look at each other and we book it back to the car. We run and we get in the car. We slam the car door. And we spend the next five minutes slapping all the mosquitoes that got in the car before we could even drive the car home. That was like, that was like three minutes outside and five minutes inside. And it was, it was terrible. I mean, it was brutal. And yet this is what God sends, whether it's mosquitoes or some other insect that bites. It, it, it was everywhere in the land. And you have to understand, you know, the, the, after God turned the, the Nile River into blood, then the, the, the first plague after that was frogs that came up out of the Nile. He, he indicated to the Egyptians, I, I control the water in your country. But the gnats, I mean, he commanded God to take the, the, the staff, or he commanded Moses to take the staff and to, and to hit the dirt. And what he's saying here is that he's God not only over the water, but he's, he's God over the land. He controls the, the, the land. And, and Pharaoh's magicians, who have replicated the others, they, they can't do this. And, and so uh, they ask, and so they ask, uh, Pharaoh asks Moses to stop. And uh, Moses prays and it stops. But here, here's the conclusion again that, that comes from this. It says this, Then the magicians said to Pharaoh, This is the finger of God. But Pharaoh's heart was hardened and he would not listen to them as the Lord had said. I mean, you, you see the theme developing here, right? I mean, it's just, comes over and over. The next plague is flies. The first two plagues, first the frogs was from the water, the gnats were from the land, the flies are from the air. And now God sends swarms of flies, hundreds of millions of flies into the land of Egypt. But now God says, I'm going to send those flies everywhere in the land of Egypt, but not in the land of Goshen. Now the land of Goshen is where the Israelites were. So you understand what God is saying here. God, God's sovereignty is so so detailed, so powerful that he controls the flights of hundreds of millions of flies. And not a single one will fly into the land of Goshen. That's the detail. That's the, the, the depth of God's sovereignty. And Mo- Moses tells us that, that the land of, of, of Egypt was ruined by, by the flies. And you have to understand, in, in Egypt, they didn't have screens on their doors and on their windows they could have potentially boarded up their doors and their windows, but it's Egypt. Their, their houses would have become like ovens. And so they were tormented by these flies. They were everywhere until Pharaoh, in desperation, finally offered a half-hearted proposal to Moses. He said, look, why don't you, why don't you take your people on like a weekend retreat in the land of Egypt? You can do a few, you know, sacrifices there. And Moses turns them down flat. No, that's, that's not what God says. It's not what we're doing. And so you can guess Pharaoh's response. Here's Pharaoh's response. 
But Pharaoh hardened his heart this time also and did not, did not let the people go. So God sends the next plague, this time on the livestock of Egypt. The goddess Hathor uh, is the mother, the sky dog goddess of the Egyptians, was represented as a cow. And so again, here we see livestock all over Egypt die from this plague. God saying, I am God over all, all the livestock too. And the response, Exodus 9, 7. But the heart of Pharaoh was hardened. He did not let the people of go. And so then, then God sent boils. God commands Moses to, to, to pick up a handful of soot from a kiln. Now, a kiln would have been a, a, a stove in which you would have baked and dried bricks. In, in other words, it would have been something that the, the Israelite slaves had to use all the time to, to make bricks. And he takes a handful of soot from there and he throws it up in the air in front of Pharaoh and boils break out on all the people of Israel. And the Hebrew word that's used for boils means like not, not just a little bit of scratchy stuff, but like festering, terrible, terrible boils uh, on people's bodies, entire bodies. And really what it is here again is God's judgment on the people of Egypt for the, the physical brutality that they displayed towards the people of Israel. For generations, they whipped them and beat them and kept them half starved. And now God brings this kind of physical uh, um, pain and suffering on the people of Egypt for the way that they enslaved the people of Israel. And it's fascinating to note that, that this time, Moses tells us that the Egyptian magicians couldn't even stand in the presence of Moses because of the boils on their bodies. The, the, the wise men, the sorcerers, who at the beginning of this thought that they could compete with God, now... Already, not even all the way into all of these plagues, literally cannot stand in Moses' presence because they are so attacked by these boils. And again, again, in spite of the brutality of these plagues that are on the land, notice Pharaoh's response and notice who's dictating that response. Here's what it says. But the Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh and he did not listen to them as the Lord had spoken to Moses. God Harden Pharaoh's heart. God dictates Pharaoh's response. And now, and now he's going to ratchet up the, 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 the judgment and, and the signs. They're going to go from being irritating and, and maybe debilitating to being downright deadly. And the first way that God is going to do that is through famine and starvation. Uh, the, next, uh, the next plague that he brings on them is going to be hail. And now God, now God brings a third reason. The third reason why he's hardened Pharaoh's heart. It's not just so that Egypt would know that he is God. It's not just so that the people of Israel would know that he is God, but it's so that you and I would know that he is God. Here's what he says. For this time, this is God speaking, for this time I will send all my plagues on you yourself and on your servants and your people so that you may know that there is no one like me in all the earth. For by now I could have put my hand, put out my hand and struck you and your people with pestilence and you would have been cut off from the earth. But for this purpose I have raised you up, to show you my power, so that my name may be proclaimed in all the earth. God hardens Pharaoh's heart. He does these things against Pharaoh and the people of Egypt, so that all of the earth, so that you and I, living thousands of years later and across the globe from Egypt, would know that God, and God alone is sovereign over all the earth. So we would know that no matter how great our culture is, no, no, matter, no matter what the powers of the gods of our day are, no matter the kind of pressures that we find ourselves under, that we would know that Yahweh, the great I Am, alone is the God who is sovereign over all of the world. And so God sends hail now on the land of Egypt. And it, it, it is, devastates the crops. The barley and the flax at that point had just come to harvest, Moses tells us, and it just destroys these crops utterly. And, and, Moses, and Pharaoh comes and, and begs Moses to, 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 let the, to, to make it stop. He says, look, I'll let the people of Israel go. And so Moses prays, and God stops the hail. And here it is again. Here's what happens. But when Pharaoh saw that the rain and the hail and the thunder had ceased, he sinned yet again and hardened his heart, he and his servants. So the heart of Pharaoh was hardened, and he did not let the people of Israel go, just as the Lord had spoken through Moses. So now God sends another plague, locusts. This is the eighth plague. 
You know, while the barley and flax were destroyed by the hail, the wheat at that time of year was just new shoots. It was just growing. And so it would have survived the hail. There there was a chance that it could have grown and fed the people of Egypt. But now God sends locusts on the land. Now, we don't know a lot about locusts in our world today, but in fact, in the year 2004 in West Africa, there was an invasion of locusts. And, and, And so we know in modern day what locusts is like. And And literally, the locust swarm, they come in swarms of billions. In fact, they come in such great swarms that in that year, in 2004, in West Africa, that people would be driving and the locusts would suddenly descend upon a road and would cover the the windshields of the cars so completely that they actually ended up in serious accidents with one another. And they found, they they studied, they found that on a square acre of land, there was up to 200,000 locusts at one time. And every locust could eat the equivalent of its body weight in a day. And the locusts travel at about 100 kilometers a day. In other words, what God sent on the land of of Egypt would have utterly stripped it bare of anything that the hail hadn't utterly destroyed. You see, these these two plagues, the hail and the locusts, they again, they were judgment on the gods of Egypt, on the god of Isis and the god of Min. And particularly on the god of Min, the god of Min was like the god that, uh, that was in charge of the crops, and they always had a big coming out party for the God of Min at just this time of year, just after the, the harvest of the barley and the flax and just before the, the harvest of the wheat. And, and instead of having some sort of celebration, their land was utterly devastated. And what God is saying is, those gods that you think control the crops, they, control, they are nothing compared to me. I control it all. And the result is that there's going to be a massive famine that will come on the land of Egypt. And many people are going to starve. And Pharaoh, Pharaoh calls Moses and he begs Moses to make it stop. And it's fascinating to see the words that he uses. Here's what he says. He says, plead with the Lord your God only to remove this death from me. Now, Pharaoh wasn't dying, but his land was dying. Pharaoh was beginning to to, to catch a glimpse. He's beginning to get the point. He, he, He realized that the plagues were not some temporary hardship that were coming on him. Rather, the plagues were were leading to death. And see, this is what happens when you live in rebellion against a holy God. The Apostle Paul, he he understands this. He explains this in a different context. In in Romans 6.23, he says this, The wages of sin is death. You see, it's not that every sin leads instantly to death, but rather that every sin moves the sinner closer and closer down the path until they come to the ultimate punishment. And the ultimate punishment for sin in a universe created by a holy God, sustained by a sovereign, all-powerful God, is death for the sinner. And Pharaoh, in his own way, Pharaoh, in in the midst of this plague that is ravaging his land, he understands that it's going to bring death on his land. And yet, And yet God isn't finished yet. So Exodus 10, 20 says this, but the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart and he did not let the people of Israel go. Pharaoh is like a, he's like a rag doll in God's hand. And yet Yahweh is now only coming to the the climax, the finale of what he has long designed to do to Pharaoh and the people of Israel. And so he sends Another plague. And again, Pharaoh is helpless to do anything about it. Helpless even in how he responds. And here's the the last plague that we're going to look at today, the second last plague that comes on the the land of Egypt. God sends darkness on the land for three days. Such darkness, Moses says, that it could be felt. Uh, You know, uh, my my daughter, my my daughter uh, is off this year at at, at a program called Kaleo. It's at Camp Quanos on the Vancouver Island. And, uh, and she's loving it. She's having the time of her life. It's like, it's Bible school, it's leadership development, and it's adventures. And, uh, and so, uh, uh, you know, she does all these different adventures. She's hiking, she's surfing out at Tofino. Uh, they, uh, uh, they went sailing on this ship through the islands. I mean, it was, I was jealous. It was, it was so amazing, the things they're doing. But the other day she said, Dad, we went caving. We went climbing in these caves. And when we got deep into the caves, then we all turned off the, the, the headlamps that we had. And she said, it was like, Dad, it was the darkest dark that you could imagine. I mean, you, you had to grope around to, to know where anything was. And, and, and she said, 
the guides who took him down, they said, look, if you stay in this kind of darkness long enough, you, you can begin to dream while you're awake, while your eyes wide open. Because it's so dark, it tricks your mind into thinking that you're asleep and you dream with your eyes wide open. And I just thought that's one more reason why I'm never going to go down into a cave like that. Like, not for me. But, but, but that's the kind of darkness you can feel. That's the kind of darkness that descended on the land of Egypt. It was utter darkness. And think about how disorienting that would be. I mean, in Egypt, you didn't just go over to the, the wall and flip on a light switch and suddenly have light. When it got dark, I mean, everything shut down. It, it, they closed the gates of cities. You barred the doors to your house. You didn't go anywhere because it wasn't safe. There was no way to get where you were going. No one moved. And, 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 and this went on, remember, for, for three days, Moses tells us. But, but they wouldn't have known that. I mean, think about, think about what would happen if in our world we had three days of utter blackness like that. I mean, it, there, would have been, there would be widespread panic. You, you, you can imagine. I mean, you, you, it wouldn't take long to begin to understand the implications of that. No, no sunlight at all means nothing grows. Nothing grows means plants and animals don't have anything to eat, to live. means that eventually we die because there's nothing to eat. And there would have been, the, on top of that, there would have just been this, this, this disorientation and this psychological distress. And, and it would have led to severe depression. I mean, the implications of it are profound. And you know the most famous god in Egypt? Re, the sun god. The God who gave light to everything in Egypt. In fact, Pharaoh's title was Amun Re. In the image of Re, Pharaoh was all about the, his connection to the sun God. And now, as God comes to the climax of what he's doing, he brings utter, complete darkness on the land of Egypt for three days to declare beyond a shadow of doubt that the greatest of the gods of Egypt, even the sun God of Egypt, is nothing and has no power compared to the might and the majesty and the power of Yahweh alone. Here's how this section ends. But the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart, and he would not let them go. Then Pharaoh said to him, to Moses, get away from me. Take care never to see my face again, for on the day you see my face, you shall die. And Moses said, as you say, I will not see your face again. And in fact, uh, Pharaoh will not see Moses' face again until the day that Pharaoh calls him in to order him to take his people and to leave the land of Egypt. But between this moment and that moment, God is going to send one more plague on the people of Egypt. And it is more terrible than anything that has happened thus far. But we're going to talk about that when we come back and continue our series in the new year. The question that I want to end on today is this. Why does this passage go out of its way over and over and over again to make us understand that it was God who hardened Pharaoh's heart? I mean, what, why is that so important? And, and what does it tell us about who God is? And what does it matter for you and me here today? The three things. First, first of all, as we've seen, God hardens Pharaoh's heart so that he can display his sovereignty over all of creation, over every aspect of, of creation. You know, in this series, we've been talking about the sovereignty of God. It's been the theme all throughout. And, and you know, it's possible for us to say, yeah, I get it. I get it. God's sovereign. I mean, he, he controls everything. He controls my life. But it's possible for us to miss how complete, how, how very profound and, and utterly sovereign he is in every aspect of our lives and, and of all of the world. And sometimes when we live in a culture that is so powerful, that it seems so dominant, that it's in some ways like ancient Egypt, we can get drawn into thinking that the gods of our culture, you know, beauty and wealth and, and fame and power and, and education and experiences and rights and, and really what other, other gods we believe there are out there, we, we, we can get drawn into this syncretism. Yahweh, the sovereign God, plus this God, plus that God, plus this God. And, and what God does here, one of the reasons that God hardens Pharaoh's heart is for our benefit. So that we would understand, so that we would see in excruciating detail that there is no other God worthy of our devotion and of our obedience and of giving our lives to none other than Yahweh alone. 
Doug Stewart writes this. This is exactly what the only true God, Yahweh, does in the book of Exodus. Easily, comprehensively, impressively, dramatically, publicly, and decisively, he demonstrates his total control over all aspects of the physical world that were thought by the Egyptians to be the province of the gods of Egypt. Listen, there is no power in your life. There is no God of this world. There is no entity seen or unseen. There is no danger, no threat, no hope, and no promise that is greater than Yahweh, the great I Am, the creator of heaven and earth. This is God's gift to you and I in this story of the plagues that he puts on Egypt, that he brings against Pharaoh. This is the first reason why God hardens Pharaoh's heart for your benefit and for my benefit, that we would understand the vast, immense and total sovereignty of God in this world. That's the first thing. But then secondly, God hardens Pharaoh's heart so that he could punish him for his wickedness. And you know, sometimes when people read this passage, they, they get a little indignant. Like, how, how dare God? How dare God harden Pharaoh's heart so that he can't repent and then punish him for his sins? I mean, that, that doesn't seem fair. They, it's like they take on Pharaoh's side. But you have to understand, first of all, that Pharaoh is not some nice guy who made some mistakes along the way. Pharaoh was a genocidal, narcissistic psychopath who ordered the, the death, the murder, the killing of innocent babies, boys, and who enslaved an entire nation based on ethnic and racial reasons. I mean, he was a wicked, wicked man. So if you believe in justice, then what God did by, by hardening Pharaoh's heart was just that. He was serving justice on Pharaoh for the wickedness that he did. It was judgment for the evil that Pharaoh and his, his forebearers had, had put on the people of Israel for 400 years. And if you're still indignant about what God did to Pharaoh, I mean, if you still feel that that, that was unfair, then let me ask you about the end of any action movie you've ever seen. I mean, in the end of... Any action movie, almost everyone, in the end, the good guy pulls out his gun and shoots the bad guy dead. And, and when that happens, my question to you is like, do you get up and stomp out of the theater saying, that's outrageous, how dare he? I doubt it. I mean, we barely bat an eyelash, do we? Why? Because, I mean, I mean we, we cheer, right? Because we say, oh, yeah, justice is done. Instantaneous, clear, you know, he gets back what he's done. And the bad guy, I mean, maybe he killed a dozen people. Maybe, I'm... I, but nothing compared to, to what Pharaoh has done. You see, there's this, this longing that we have for justice. And God, that's what God delivers to Pharaoh here. He hardens Pharaoh's heart so that he can be the God of justice that he is by his very nature. That's the second reason he hardens Pharaoh's heart. But, but then here's the third reason why God hardens Pharaoh's heart. Because he chose to. God hardens Pharaoh's heart because it's God's prerogative. He has every right to harden whoever's heart he so deems because he is God. And for us who are created, I mean, we struggle with that. We're like, well, God, that doesn't seem fair. And even the Apostle Paul, I mean, he, he wrestles with this question because we see it around us. But he, he wrestles it with it this way. He says, like, God, why is it that, that after Jesus came, why is it that you save some of the Jewish people and not others? What, why is it that some Gentiles you save and others you don't? And then he looks back at the story of Jacob and Esau. He says, well, Jacob and Esau, even though Esau was the older, older one, even before they were born, before they did anything, God chose Jacob because that's what God gets to do. He's, he's God. And then he turns to the story of, of Pharaoh, the one that we've been looking at today. And, and here's what he writes. He says, what shall we say then? Is there injustice on God's part? By no means. For he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. So then it depends not on human will or exertion, but on God who has mercy. You understand what Paul just wrote there? I mean, Paul says, look, God's mercy in your life, the fact that God would choose you, has nothing to do with you. I mean, it has nothing to do with how hard you try, how good you are, or, or what you've done, nothing at all. It's purely because in his grace, he chose you. It's his right to do. And thank God he did. Here's what he goes on to say. For the scripture says to Pharaoh, for this very purpose I have raised you up, 
that I may show my power in you and that my name might be proclaimed in all the earth. So then he, God, has mercy on whomever he wills and he hardens whomever he wills. You might say, well, that doesn't seem fair. God, I mean, how, how, how can I be held responsible for what I do if, 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 if you harden my heart, if you harden someone's heart? And, and Paul, he, he gets that. He, he anticipates your, uh, your objection and here's what he says. You'll say to me then, why does he, God, still find fault? For who can resist his will? But who are you, O man, to answer back to God? Will what is molded say to its molder, Why have you made me like this? Has the potter no right over the clay to make out of the same lump one vessel for honorable use and another for dishonorable use? In other words, it's the prerogative of God. He, he created all of us. And it's his right to decide if he wants to harden some people's hearts and have mercy on other people's hearts. In fact, there's a reason why he would harden some people's hearts, and it's for the sake of those that he has mercy on. Look, look at what he goes on to say. What if God, desiring to show his wrath and to make known his power, has endured with much patience vessels of wrath prepared for destruction, i.e. Pharaoh, in order to make known the riches of his glory for vessels of mercy, which he's prepared beforehand for glory, i.e. you and I. I mean, what if God chose to harden Pharaoh's heart so that you and I and millions of others would see the majesty and the glory and the sovereignty of God and submit to him and give our lives to walk in the ways that he has called us to do? I mean, that, that's what God is doing. So we have no right to stand in judgment of God and say, how dare you? Why would you? No, no. The response for you and I, our response should be worship. Our response should be gratitude that God in His grace would choose us. That God in His grace would pour His mercy out on us. And the result of understanding the vast, intense depth of the, the sovereignty of God is it should strengthen our faith. It, 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 we don't understand always why God does things the way He does. But that's because He's God. I mean, if you understood everything that He did and why He did it, then he would be no greater than you. There'd be no reason to have God in your life. We don't understand it all, but we do understand that he is a good God, that he is sovereign in all of his ways, and that he works all things together for good, for those who love him and are called according to his purposes. And so, and so that means that, that when we're in prison with Joseph, like he was in Egypt, when, 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 when we find you know, our baby in, in, the, in the reeds by the Nile, like, like Moses' parents found Moses. When we find ourselves in, in difficult situations like the people of Israel under the taskmasters of Pharaoh. When, when we experience the beatings that the Apostle Paul did as he was faithful to Christ. When, when we are on the cross like Jesus was on the cross. The fact of God's all-wise, utter sovereignty in our life should strengthen our faith. It should get steel to the backbone of our faith so that we can endure whatever it is that we face because we know that God is sovereign over all, that there is no God like him, and that in the end, his will, his majesty, his glory will be done through our lives and in this world. And that, brothers and sisters, that's good news. That, that's gospel. That's something that we can go forward with a confidence in this world that you will not find in any other way. It's a lesson from these stories in the book of Exodus. Would you join me? Let me pray for you. God, the, the concept of your sovereignty, God, when we really begin to drill into it, when we really begin to, to press into it, is so, so vast, so deep. Sometimes it, it kind of blows our mind. God, sometimes we struggle a little bit like, yeah, well, but what, how, how it doesn't... Father, may we remember again our place. God, may we remember again that you indeed are sovereign over all, and therefore ours is not to figure it all out. Ours, God, is to understand, but Lord, then to live in light of it. Father, to, to operate in light of the, the hope that we have. And Father, with incredible gratitude, God, that you would choose us, that we have done nothing worthy of it, that you would send Jesus, and through Jesus, that you would give us life. Lord, we bless you and we thank you. And so today we, we lift our hearts again to worship you, the great God, the great I am. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I can't.
Bless my mind to Calvary, where Jesus bled and died for me. I see his wounds, his hands, his feet, my Savior on that cursed tree. body bound and drenched in tears they laid him down in Joseph's tomb the entrance sealed by heavy stone Messiah still and all
Hey, thank you for joining us again today. I, I hope that you've just been encouraged and strengthened again in your walk with, with Jesus and, and you're trusting God. Well, a couple of things I just want to remind you. Christmas is coming up. Please, please do invite people to come and to, to, to experience Christmas together with us. You're welcome to join us at the church if you'd like. It's going to be gorgeous, decorated, and it just, it's just such a good time to be together. But if not at the church, then join us online, and we look forward to seeing you there. Also, as we've been talking, uh, we've been asking everyone who calls Ridge Church home uh, to, to pledge towards this next phase of our building campaign. We asked everyone last week, and this week all kinds of people have pledged. It's just been so encouraging as people have been obedient to what God has called them to do and say, yeah, we're going we're gonna to pledge too. And so I just want to invite you, if you haven't yet, please go online. There's a place where you can pledge there. And we just want to trust God that he's going to uh, help us be good stewards, not only of the outside of our building, but also also of the inside. I want to end now by reading to you some words from the Apostle Paul at the end of this passage that we've been looking at today. In chapter Romans chapter 9 and 10, uh, he says, he explains about the sovereignty of God. And here at the end of, uh, it goes on in Romans chapter 11. Here in 11, beginning in verse 33, he breaks into worship. Here's what he says. Oh, the depth of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and how inscrutable his ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord or who has been his counselor or who has given him a gift to be repaid? For from him and through him and to, to him are all things. To him be glory forever and ever. Amen. Man, we serve such a great God. God bless you. Have a great week. We look forward to seeing you soon.